Oh, so good to be with you this morning. We're happy to be here. It's uh, interesting. You had the Parkers here last Sunday, and we, were, we just saw them in Orlando, had dinner with them, and then able to come. And you're just going to get a double dose of the islands these, these, these few weeks. That's right. You won't, know how, you won't know what hits you have so much. Brethren, we are updating our database for our newsletter, and so if you are receiving our newsletter and you would like to continue receiving our newsletter, then please give me your address. We're going to throw the old one away because we believe there, there are many uh, errors in that old one, and so we're redoing our newsletter list. You can receive it by email, which is a little bit easier for us, but we'd be very happy to send you the print version if that is what you would like to have. So please just give me your name and either email address or regular mailing address, and we'll keep the newsletter coming to you. Or maybe you're new in the congregation here and you'd like to receive it, and so we'd be very happy to to get it coming your way. The people over in the islands really hold on to their history and their culture. You know, the the Palauans, Palau is a small country. We work with Palau and Chuk, and the Palauans, uh, there's only about 15,000 of them. They're in Palau. There's a substantial population in Hawaii, in Guam, and in Oregon. The Pacific Islanders have targeted Oregon. But uh, otherwise, the hub of their culture is there in Palau. And so you're only talking about 15,000 people, so there's not very many to carry on things like the uh, traditions that they have had and their language. A lot of the young people coming up do not know many of the words, the traditional Palawan words in that language, and the older people are getting concerned that maybe their language is, is, is in danger of passing away. And so they hold on to what they can as tightly as they can. And some of the things that they hold on to are their legends, their stories and their traditions. And so these are fables, like you have Pecos Bill, they have uh, Melek the giant firebird, So they hold on to those because they don't want to lose their culture and their tradition and their history. So this morning, what I would like to do is to share with you about the work over in Palau and Chuk, branching off of some of the Palauan legends. And so we'll start with Melek the giant firebird. There was a a shark fisherman who who would always go fishing for sharks in, in, in an area of driftwood. And one day while he was fishing, a giant bird came down and caught a shark in its, in its huge talons and then took off with that shark. And so the man later that day was over on the sand drawing a picture of the bird that he saw and the bird came down right behind him and turned into a man. Of course, these are all fictional stories. Turned into a man and, uh, and started speaking with the fisherman. The fisherman invited him to his house for breakfast. And so they went over there together and when the, when the bird man saw the fisherman's baby, he turned back into a bird and, and leapt toward the baby. The fisherman, thinking quickly, grabbed a burning stick out of the fire and threw it at the, at the bird and it caught its wings on fire. The bird took off across the sky and today when the Palauans see a shooting star, they say, oh, just like Melek the giant fire bird. Well, that's one of their stories. So this morning, we're not going to shoot across the sky, but we do want to shoot across the island of Chuk. We'll go over to Chuk, and this morning, we'll start up at the airport. Then we're talking about this part of the world, Micronesia. Palau and Chuk are both in Micronesia. And so you can see the size of the airport there in the picture, and that gives you an idea of the size of the island. This is a small place. We're going to start at the airport and, and look at the three congregations that we have there on the island of Wino in the state of Chuk, in the Federated States of Micronesia. The first one is the Naaman Church of Christ. We have a church building there. And then we're going to wrap around the island over to the Epinoop Church of Christ building. And this is a more remote village, a little bit difficult to get to. And then we're going to go back the way that we came, up to the top of the mountain in Miari, and see the brethren up there. Now, they're just a small little group. They're meeting inside of a home, but they're meeting faithfully, and they are uh, growing in the faith. Days in Chuk are busy. It is not the case where you can just walk up to someone and say, hey, let's study the Bible together and instantly get a Bible study. But it is easy enough to get Bible studies when they know you, when you have earned some of their trust and, can get an, and they have an idea of who you are. And so we're able to get Bible studies after having lived there for these 
We live in Palau and I make trips to Chuuk, but after having been working there for these uh, 13 years, the people know me, and so they're willing to study the Bible with me where they are not so willing to study with others. And so that's an advantage in the work that we're thankful for. So the days are busy. We spend as much time traveling as we do in actual Bible studies, but it'll be uh, leaving the hotel or camping area around 9 a.m., getting out to Epinoop around 10 a.m., and getting there, if it's been raining, then this road can be very rough and, and sometimes even uh, insurpassable in a two-wheel drive vehicle. And so when it's like that, then we'll get in a boat and go around into the old Japanese dock and get to the Epinoop Church building that way. The uh, people in Epinoop, the church out there, are growing and they are eager to be studying the Bible with us. We get to that church building and call out one side, Bible study, and then go to the other side of the building and call out Bible study. They really don't start getting around and coming until we get there. Because of the road condition, they're very used to people saying, well, we'll be there at 10, and then if it's raining, maybe they don't show up, or other, other circumstances keep them from showing up. So they wait until we get there, and then get around and come on over for the Bible study. The uh, people are slow to change, but they do change. And the reason I think that they're that way is because they want to be very sure in what they do. They don't want to just make a snap decision and do something and then it not, not pan out and not turn, not turn into something that lasts. So that's good, brethren. We're thankful for that. We want them, when it comes to their faith, to, to make a decision that's going to last. So I'm glad that they're slow to change. That shows that they're thinking through it all the way. The people will study the Bible with us if they know us and if they trust us. The Chukis people are a humble people. They live in humble conditions. But it's funny because they get to see movies, the same movies that you see. They're just pirated movies that have come out of the Philippines. So they've seen all of the superhero movies, and they know exactly what your life is like. All right. The, uh, like, like Sepeta here. Sepeta's wife is a member of the church. Sepeta is not, and we've been working with him. But because they see those movies... They, they, they know that they don't have a, a fully accurate understanding of what your life is like here, but they know this much for sure, that it is much more affluent than what they know, and that most of them will probably never see it and never experience it. Most of the people here, especially out in Ipanoop Village, the best they could ever do, and, 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 and what they probably will never do is even just get to Guam, get to Guam, which is a U.S. territory and a much more modern. There's a significant Chukis population in Guam, but it's just out of their reach. That airfare is just out of their reach. And so Sepeta, if we go and talk with Sepeta, he's going to be very humble and very shy and frankly very ashamed of his living conditions because he has seen those movies and houses that he doesn't even, he's not even able to explain the kind of wall covering that's there, nor how it's installed or how it's maintained or anything about it. It's just beyond his understanding because he's never seen it. He's never been able to feel it and see it installed and watch a YouTube video on putting the mud on the wall or anything like that. And so it's just beyond. And it looks fantastic and it's just beyond. So Sepeta then, if we go and, and want to talk with him about the Bible, he's going to be very shy very pulled back, his head, head, head come down, and, uh, and, and just very, very reserved. Ashamed because his pants are hanging on the roof, and the roof is made out of tin, and both his pants and the roof have holes in them. And so, brethren, what we have to do is break down that barrier between us. We, we, we have to get to the point where we can talk to this man in a very relaxed way so that, so that he can tell us why he doesn't want to be baptized or the thoughts that, that, that he's having about spiritual things and be able to ask questions, what about this and what about this? We've got to be able to break through that barrier. And so it just takes time. We'll go and sit down outside of his house. There'll be a log there, a tree that's fallen that they've moved over for, for sitting on, and we'll just sit there and talk to him. And the first two, three, four times that we go and sit and talk to, talk to Sepeda, now we have the Bible studies at the church building, and he's invited. But in order to really get where we need to go, we've got to go to his house and talk to him and, and break down that barrier. So in addition to the Bible study, we'll go here. And the first three or four times, we're going to lead the conversation. We're going to be pulling uh, answers out of him. 
we're going to understand that he would really rather us not be there because it's uncomfortable for him, but we're going to keep going. And we're going to keep talking to him over and over again until he's able to relax and we can talk. And then we can really start to talk about the Bible and talk about his life and his need uh, to put the Lord on in baptism. And so it just takes time, but we're able to get there. We're able to do it. And that is how we are having uh, the baptisms that are taking place there in Chuuk, several which I'll show you in a few minutes. But, uh, but that's how. And those are some of the barriers that we face in order to get where we, where we want to go. The uh, people in Epinute Village are a poor people. I want to share with you one of the young ladies. This is Love C. And Love C's in a unique situation. She's a 14 year old girl. She has a misaligned eye. Now, out here in Epinute Village, there are no police, there are no police officers that are out there. And so it's kind of whoever has the largest arms makes the rules. It's not good, but that's the way it is. So they're, they're out there, they're kindly governing, governing themselves out there, and that misaligned eye that she has, I'm so sorry to say, puts her on a lower level socially in a place that she's already at a lower level because they're very poor and they're out there in the, in, in the sticks, in the, in the village, in the remote village. And so uh, because both of her parents are members of the church, we are going to do something that we very rarely do. We usually don't get involved with medical activities. But in this case, we're going to try to take her to the Philippines and be able to get that eye aligned. She won't be able to see out of it, but we can get it aligned, and that will help her for the rest of her life. It will just help her standing in her position for the rest of her life. And so I ask Love, see, take me to your house. And it's because I want to tell the U.S. brethren about you. So take me to your house and show me your room. So now we're in her house. And brethren, there are no chairs. There's not a table. I mean, there are no chairs. Sometimes they will have a plastic chair that you get at uh, Lowe's or Home Depot, something like that, for $20, you know. But, you know, those break. And so they don't last very long. The, this is her room. There's one article of clothing hanging in the, from the ceiling there, but otherwise that's it. The clothing that they have is shared among her and her sisters. Now someone will say, well, why don't they take care of things and then they would have things? But brethren, here's, here's what happens. For example, we've taken in little toys, little Happy Meal toys for the children and, and, and given them out and then come back, you know, a week later, where's your toys? Oh, they're all gone. They're all broken. So, well, why didn't you take care? You don't ever get any toys. You don't have any toys. Why didn't you take care of the little toy that you had? So they play rough with them. They're a rough, they're a rough people and, and the children are rough and they play rough with the toys and they break. Well, imagine with me that you had one little boy who had his toy and, and he loved it very much and he's really going to try to take care of it. And so he does, and he keeps it, keeps it right here all day long and just plays with it and won't let the other kids play with it. Well, then when he falls asleep, the brothers and the sisters come over. They take that toy. They go outside. They play rough with it, and it's gone. And so you say, well, why don't they take care of things? Well, brethren, it's just it's so much harder to do than it sounds. The, the windows, you see the windows? They're those slat, slat windows. And so even when they're shut, they're not going to keep the moisture out. I'll show you a picture of their Bibles in a few minutes that they just soak up the moisture. The pages just, the Bible gets thick because they soak up the moisture. It's just not conducive for taking care of things. It's difficult to take care of things. But she did have a report card handwritten by the teacher taped on the wall. And I said, well, there's something that I can share. Love sees a good student. And so if you'd like to know more about, uh, about Love C, then, then let me know. But uh, we're looking forward to continual um, progress in that, in that way. So the brethren in Epinoop are a little bit difficult to get to, but they are growing in the faith. And we are thankful to be able to be a part of, of their lives out there. And so that's the morning Bible study. And after the morning Bible study, it's back to town to have lunch. And then sometimes I'll have a companion with me. Maybe you'd like to come and go to Chuuk with me. And so we'll go to town and have a bite of lunch. And this is the restaurant. But you see, there's no sign on this restaurant. There's no sign because of that very relaxed island mentality. You know, you've, you've heard of island time. And you say, yes, we know island time. We've seen the Bahamas and we've seen Jamaica. And that's cute. Island time, man, yes. Well, the, uh, the islanders, they really have that island time. But you know, the island time is not the, not the culmination of that thing. Uh, there's a relaxed mentality about everything. 
And so there's no sign in front of the Layside restaurant. There are really no tourists to speak of in Chuuk. Those tourists who come are divers, and they've come to dive the World War II wrecks. They stay in the hotels. They eat in the hotels. And so no need for these Chukis people in their minds to put up a sign out front. The tourists really don't come here. It's a local place, and everybody on this small island already knows where we are. And so there's no need for a sign. And so that relaxed mentality keeps them from putting a sign out front. But did you know that that relaxed island mentality affects the work of the church? And here I'm going to share with you how. The uh, brethren in Naaman are growing. The church in Naaman is the largest of the three. We have about 30 members of the church there. And the, it has been in existence longer than the others. And so they're expecting deeper, stronger Bible studies. And we're very thankful for that. The churches are growing. You see their stages from infant to, to developing. And it's really neat. But on a Sunday earlier this year, just before we came into report, I was making arrangements with the brethren about, I'm going to pick you up at this time, you up at this time. We'll all go down to the Naaman building for worship. And I had a full car. And so one of the sisters brought a visitor which is great, but what it meant was I didn't have time to pick up or didn't have space in the car to pick up all of the brethren that I'd committed to pick up. So I said, okay, well, I'll take them down to Naaman, then I'll come back to town and pick up Antony and then come back. We'll have to start a little bit late because of that, but uh, th th that's okay. We can, we can just explain to any visitors. So the girl in the white and green is our member of the church, and the lady in front of her in the black dress is the visitor. And you'll notice her to stop a few times and look around as she approaches the church building. She's doing that because the brethren have not very well prepared the grounds for worship. They, they are making a new driveway, and it's just mud. There's no gravel. It's just dirt. And what you can't see is water that she's having to step over to get to the church building. The... Uh, Brethren should have put some tin down or some gravel or sand or something, even if it's just cut grass, to make a path, but they didn't. Here the visitor is in her Sunday, her best moo moo, okay? This is her Sunday clothes, and she's in her Sunday shoes, and she's having to move around. And then she gets past that, and look at the grass. The grass is so high. It's almost knee high there. I had asked the brethren to cut the grass, but they didn't cut the grass. They forgot about it. There's the relaxed island mentality. You see, it's not so cute anymore, is it? That's right. But this is the kind of thing that is just normal for the islands. We expect it. We've gotten very used to it, and it, it is detrimental. This is not good, what she is seeing and what she's having to step around and move over. She will interpret that as these people don't care about the worship of the church. They don't care about their church building enough to take care of it in the right way. And she's right. She's right. They should have done that. I had asked them to do it. They, they should have done it. They didn't do it. And it is detrimental. Well, brethren, that's why they need us there. That's where, that's where the Bible conflicts with their culture. That relaxed island mentality and taking care of things and preparing for the worship, the Bible conflicts with their culture. And so that's what they need us for, and that's, that's what we're being a part of. Now, I'm happy to tell you that, well, that, that's not the end of the story. When I got there and dropped off these, these ladies, and I was wanting to just film two ladies walking up to the church building, and then I got this, this uh, lady looking at all of the negative things. So then I went to Rakenta, one of the sisters, and I said, did you pick up Matlin and Torin? And she said, no. I had asked them to pick up Matlin and Torin. And so I said, okay, well, 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 can you get in your car and go get Matlin and Torin? Little rundown boonie car, brethren, held together with duct tape, but, but it rolls, so that's good. I'll go get Antony, and you go get Matlin and Torin. Okay, so she goes to the car. Joey, there's a flat tire. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll wheel it down. to the, There's a house down the road where they fix cars. There's 15 cars piled up outside. They've got an air compressor down there. Roll down the road, fill up the tire. It's a slow leak, and so you can go and get Matlin and Torin. Okay, so she rolls down there on the rim to get it air, air, filled up. Comes back, Joey, the air compressor's broken. Yes. Okay, all right. So I'll go get Anthony, and then I'll go get Matlin and Torin. The worship services are going to start about an hour late, 
And so that's going to be extra impressive to this visitor who's already seen what she has seen. I go and get those brethren, we get back, and then I grab a translator and go talk to the visitor. And I talk about the grass, explain about the grass and about the, the, the construction road. I try to put a positive spin on that. The brethren are expanding. They're looking to make a, you know, a road up the mountain so it's more beneficial to the church and people can get here easier. And then about the lateness, we had so many people we want to come, they want to come today that we're just pressed for time to pick them all up. Uh, these are the kinds of things that make the work fun and interesting, but it's always a challenge, right? And so this visitor on the way to the church building that morning was stone silent. She didn't know us, most of us in the car, and so just quiet as a mouse. Brethren, on the way back... After the worship services, dropping her off, she talked nonstop. She talked nonstop. And what she talked about was how much she enjoyed the worship service. It was one of those constant roll kind of things where you really can't get a word in edgewise. I was amazed. She didn't pay attention to those negative things. She paid complete attention to the scripturalness of the worship, that, uh, that it was organized and prepared. We didn't have everything right that day, but brethren, we had the most important things right, and it impressed her. And so I have no doubt that on the next trip we'll be able to uh, have set up one-on-one -on -one Bible studies with this lady, and we'll look forward to doing that. But uh, that's, that's, that's the afternoon study, the early afternoon study. And then it's uh, on up to Miari, to the mountain uh, up there. And this little church up here is about six members. They are needing those very, very basic teachings. We continually talk about four things, and we will continue to talk about those four things until they really have them down. We talk about the distinctiveness of the church. We need them to understand how their beliefs are different from other people's beliefs, that their beliefs are founded in the scripture, and that matters. So the distinctiveness of the church is one of the main things that we talk about. We talk about how to worship God and show, of course, from the Bible, this is how God wants us to worship. We talk about the importance of worshiping every Sunday. This is another one of those basic things. It's not in their culture. It's not in their history to think that way. And so the importance of worshiping God every Sunday. And then personal Bible study. These are the four things we cover over and over again. You say, well, Joey, didn't you cover that before the baptism? Absolutely. Every one of them in detail. But you have to go over it many times with these good people in order for it to get really cemented into their minds. And so we continue, continue doing that. But the group is growing. We always have visitors up here. This is Pia over on the left side and Noniko over on the right side. Two of our longest standing Bible students up there, both members of the church and both continuing to grow. Uh, the chicken was there for three consecutive Bible studies. The, uh, the, uh, the Filipinos are in both Palau and Chuk, and they have a recipe called chicken adobo. And you want to go home and look this up and then try it. It's bay leaves, black peppercorns, soy sauce, and vinegar. And so we threatened the chicken that if he keeps coming, we're going to baptize him in a pot of chicken adobo. <laughs> and, uh, we, yeah, that's right. Chester is, is Pia's husband. Chester is Pia's husband, and we've been working on him for about two years. But, you know, I talked about how it goes slow sometimes, and it, it went slow with him. But, brethren, this year in March, Chester was baptized and added to the kingdom, and so we're very thankful, thankful for that. So the church up in Miari is growing. That's our late afternoon Bible study. We really have to get back to either the, the camping area or the hotel before dark. Chuk is not a safe place to be uh, after dark. Here's the Bible, one of the Bibles. <clears throat> and you can see that it's just, just worn out. The pages wrinkled. It just soaks up that moisture and uh, just does not last. They're simple, hardback Bibles. They don't have leather Bibles. This is the... This is... One, there are three different Chukis Bibles that exist, and this is the most common one and the mo one that we're able to, able to get. The word for God is kot, K-O-T, and so maybe you can see that on that page here in Genesis 2. 
We are trying to get more Bibles for them because the Bibles wear out. A Bible there in Chuuk will last about two years, and uh, then it really is just going to be falling apart and needing to be replaced. Well, we can't hardly find them. I can find them at a bookstore in Guam, but I'm never in Guam. We, we heard that a lady at this college had them for sale, and at a great price, $10 a piece. And so I would buy a whole case immediately at that price if I could get them. But the thing is, the lady who had them is a islander who is in a position of authority, which means she comes and goes as she pleases. So brethren, we went to this office no, no doubt 20 different times during business hours trying to catch her and find her and, and never could. Well, we will continue to try, and Lord willing, we'll be able to get Bibles for, for, these, uh, for these people. You say, well, here they can have an, an English Bible. Really won't help. In Palau, the common language is English. In Chuuk, it's Chukis, And so we, we have to find the Chukis Bibles. But the churches in Chuuk, they are growing and they are moving forward. And we're very, very happy to be able to say that. Hey, let me tell you about another one of the Palauan legends. And this is the legend of the first natural childbirth. The story goes that before this time, the, the women did not know how to deliver babies. And so they would do a, a C-section with sharpened shells, and the mother would not survive. Well, there was a spider. There was a spider. It's a gruesome story, right? It's like Grimm's fairy tales. You really don't want to know the story. The uh, spider would come down, and he had the ability to turn into a man, right? So he came down, and he fell in love with one of the girls from a village, and they got married, and she became pregnant, and uh, here she is getting some titamel fruit from, from the man. But then when it came time for her to deliver, he did not want to lose his wife, and so he went back into the spider form and back up the tree and talked to his spider mother, who taught him how to deliver human babies naturally. And so he came down, locked the doors of the house when it was time for her to deliver, delivered the baby naturally, and saved his wife and the baby, and, and taught all of the Palauans how to deliver babies naturally. Now, interestingly enough, in Palau today, you can't get a, an epidural. It is only natural childbirth. So, ladies, if you want a natural childbirth, come on out to Palau. They're experts at it. <laughs> there are many births physically. There are many births spiritually. And since we were with you last, there have been a number of baptisms. We uh, take a lot of time with each and every one who is baptized. The goal is not just to baptize. It's a step along the way. Uh, the goal is to make disciples. The goal is to make disciples, and baptism is how we, how we get there. But usually, in Chuuk, when someone requests to be baptized, they haven't finished all of the studies yet, and, and we want them to be able to count the cost, like these two slides are, are showing from Luke 14. Brethren, a very important Bible principle, especially in the islands, because sometimes their approach to baptism will be as simple as this. I've been bad lately. Look, there's a church that's baptizing people today. I'll go get baptized, and that'll make up for what I've done lately, and then I can be even again. And so that's not good, is it? We want them to count the cost of being a Christian. We want them to understand that the Lord is adding them to the church, that they're going to need to worship with the church every Sunday and be growing in the faith, of all that the Lord wants of us. And so we will postpone that baptism and say, well, we're so glad that you're interested in being baptized, but can you continue coming to the Bible studies with us? And then once they finish that, then we will um, thankfully be able to do that baptism. Since I was with you last, my two children were baptized. I was not able to be there for their baptism. This is their grandfather doing it. I had gone back to Palau. The family stayed here to finish up some medical treatment, and so I missed the baptisms. Greater than their physical birth day, greater than the day of their possible marriage one day, is this day, and I missed it. And so sometimes people say, well, what, uh, what is the greatest sacrifice that you have made on the mission field? That's it for sure. The reason I tell you that is because we need to elevate and lift up days like this, baptism days, as the most important day of a person's life. It is, isn't it? It is the most important day of a person's life. And so may we rejoice in it with all of those islanders and with each and every one who is baptized. The uh, islanders, to go on to another legend, the islanders have uh, money beads. It's a necklace, but it has actual value there in Palau. Not so much as a monetary value, but a value in the culture. And so the ladies who are higher up, well, they'll have a money bead and, uh, and they use these in their customs. And so there was a man who 
was walking through the forest, and he had, he had done something against the Palauan culture, and so he was turning to stone, and his feet had already turned to stone. And the man saw another man, and he gave him an orange and a seed and said, plant this seed, and the tree that comes up, you cut into that fruit, and you'll find something special. And so he did, and the, he and his wife waited for that tree, to the one fruit to fall from that tree. And the man went fishing and said, if the fruit falls, we'll keep it for me because we want to open it together when I get back. And she said, okay. And so off he went, and then surely enough, the fruit fell, and she put it in the house safe and sound. And then one of the highest ranking ladies in the, in the village came and visited her, and she had nothing to give. This is very shameful for her. And so she gave her the fruit. And that high-ranking lady took a knife and cut into that, cut into that fruit, and there was a very valuable money seed inside, money, money bead inside. And so she quickly put it in her bag and took off. And today, that uh, money bead is very, very valuable because of the legend. And where the knife went across that money bead, there's a, there's a stripe, a scar on the money bead there. And so that is something that's very, very unique and very valuable in Palau to the people today. Well, we have something unique also in the brethren. After they're baptized, we continue teaching them and helping them to learn how to be growing in the faith. We have uh, the children's class. Many of the materials that Tammy has are from uh, churches like this one that have sent materials out to us. And then, brethren, we work on continuing to teach the islanders so that they can be edified and they can be equipped and continue than teaching other people. And so it's a continual learning process, continual growing process, and uh, we're thankful to be able to be a part of it. Some of these men that you will recognize uh, as coming and having reported here. That, that man I think you know, Robert Martin. He was with me in uh, March of this year. Robert is always a great encouragement. We have ladies' classes sometimes. When a lady can come out, we'll have teen, a teenager can come out, and we'll have uh, teen classes. So maybe, maybe you can come out. Let me know if you're interested in this kind of thing. The brethren are getting practice in preaching. This is in Palau now, in the Palau Church building. The brethren are getting practice in preaching and teaching because the day may come. We don't have any thoughts to leave the islands, but the day will come one day when we're not there, and we want them to continue on without us. Well, let me tell you about Angar and the giant bat of Angar. This is the, one of the southern islands there of Palau, and there used to be a giant bat with a 60-foot wingspan that would come and land on the houses and flap his wings and destroy the house. And so the people left Angar and went to the northern island of Koror. But some of them stayed, and they said, we're going we're gonna to trap that bat. And so they set up bamboo poles that had been sharpened inside of one of the houses. And when the bat landed on the house and flapped his wings and the roof came in, down came the bat onto those poles. The people took the head of that giant bat to the Ibadul of Koror, the high chief of Koror, and presented it to him there. The uh, giant bat did not land on our church building, thankfully. And so it is still there and still doing well. The uh, denominations come into Palau or Anchuk, Palau Anchuk, and put down a lot of money and, and deliver to them a turnkey building, there's a problem with that. And that is that the islanders never really see that, the church building and by association the church. You and I understand the difference between the church building and the church. Most people in the world don't, and most people in the islands don't. And so they see the church building and the church all together as a foreign institution. Well, we didn't want that to be the case with our work, and so we built the church building very slowly. The brethren helped us to do so, and now they have a building that they are connected to and that they um, helped to build both financially and with their own uh, sweat and tears also. So this was a way that we helped to get them invested in the church building, and we believe that it has been functional. We are just finishing up now the first floor this year. We have the electrical done, the classroom is done, an air conditioner put in the classroom, and our stairs finished, and so that is something that has taken place. Now I'm going to move a little more quickly as we come through to the end of our talk this morning. The time always goes by so quickly. Palau is not as underdeveloped as Chuk is. Palau is uh, by no means modern, but it is more modern. We have three good grocery stores in Palau. I mean, how many more do you need, right? And so the, uh, the, 
Uh, we don't have any U.S. chain restaurants. We don't have a bowling alley or, or, or McDonald's or a mall or a movie theater or something like that. But we do have uh, churches that are growing. These slides are talking about the need to keep the church pure. The islanders struggle with promiscuity, uh, having relationships outside of marriage. And so we want the church to maintain its candlestick. And so we work with them to help to keep that keep that right in the Lord's eyes, and so that's a challenge. So now let me tell you about Joey, and then Joey is a man that I met in a taxi, and he and I just hit it off. Some personalities just click, and he is one of those guys that he was, he was baptized. Right, before his baptism, I said, well, Joey, how can I come and visit you on the next trip? We can study some more. And he said, well, I live in Panawat. You see, there's not even a dot. It's so remote. There's not even a dot for Panawat. I said, well, what's your cell phone number? And I'll call you. He said, there's no cell phone. I said, well, what's your landline? And I'll call you. No, no, no landline on Panawat. Well, what's the address then, Joey? We'll just do it old school style and I'll send you a letter. He said, there's no post office on Panawat. And there's no electricity. No, no, no electricity on Panawat either. And so... I said, uh, well, Joey, then what are we going to do? He said, well, you have to communicate with me over the FM radio. The FM radio. You go to the radio station. This is a message for Joey Uro on Panawat Island. Joey Treat is coming on the next supply ship. Get ready for him. And it goes out to all of the islands. And hopefully somebody listening will tell Joey the message. And, and he'll be ready when I get there. Well, brethren, when I got back to Chuk, he had not gone back to Ponawat. He had a medical need to stay on the main island. Hermas, the preacher at the local congregation, had baptized him. And Joey had started preaching and teaching and being involved. Just one of those great, great situations that you hope for and you look for and that you need as an encouragement in the work. And Joey was it. And then we learned that Joey was not really married to the lady that he was living with very common in Chuk. A uh, marriage license in Chuk cost $50. $50. Some of our sisters work hard for $8 a day. And so what percentage of that money do you think goes for food? 100%. And so something like a marriage certificate, they just say, no, we, 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 we will not do that. We'll just live together like everybody else does. Well, brethren, that's not good and not right. So we, we have to talk to them. And, and with Anita, whom I had not met before, his, his girlfriend that he called his wife. And if I had been there during the baptism, we would have covered this before the baptism, but I wasn't there. And so that means that we're going to start the process with Anita. We're going to start going to her house and, and going to talk to Anita. And her head drops down like this because she's super shy because all the others are super shy. And so if another visit, another visit, and another visit. And Anita, will you marry Joey? No. So another visit and another visit and another visit. Anita, will you marry Joey? Okay. And so they agreed to get married. And uh, Anita and Joey were married this year. The Chukis people do not do public display, PDA, public displays of affection at all. I mean, at all, not even holding hands in public. It's just taboo. And so I said to Joey, Joey, at the end of the ceremony, do you want to kiss, you know, the way we do in the, in the U.S.? And, and he said, okay. So they did it. <laughs> they did it. That's right. And we present, and then after the wedding, brethren, Joey got right back into the teaching and the preaching that he was doing before, and so just excellent. Now, we've not, we've not been able to baptize Anita yet, but we have had several studies together, and I believe that she'll be coming around, that she'll be coming around soon. And so that's, that's Joey. The uh, Se'emalong and the crocodile. The Se'emalong could read a, a, a pierced clamshell and know if the crocodiles were near the... Uh, the river when his children went there to throw the scraps left over from dinner into the water. And so he could always avoid the crocodile. So the crocodile came to Se'emalong and said, teach me how to read the clamshell and I'll never hurt any of your children. So they said, okay. Said, identify your children. They can, they can wear the, the coconut leaves around their necks, okay? And so then all of the children started wearing coconut leaves around their necks and none of the crocodiles ever got any of the children anymore after that day. Well, they were smart children. Well, brethren, we are smart children as well. We're the children of, of our Father, all of us together. We're the children of our Father, aren't we? Because we're working together. The islanders have a great, a great effect in their lives. Your, your involvement in the work affects them eternally. Those who've been baptized, and many that we've seen. That last is another one who's been baptized since I was with you last. But brethren, not only in eternity is their life affected, but here and now. Last put off his baptism for three years. 
because he was addicted to marijuana, very, very common in Chuuk. Most of the people smoke it regularly. And he knew he couldn't be a Christian and be doing that. And so uh, three years, but then finally last decided to put his Lord on in baptism and to give up the marijuana. Now he's a policeman and he arrests people who smoke marijuana. <laughs> yeah. And that's convenient because he knows all of them, right? That's right. So his life greatly changed. His life's greatly changed now. Eternity, yes, but even here and now. This is his wife, Caprin. And Caprin, her life, in eternity, yes, but here and now. She has a husband now who's, who's in, engaged with a the family. They're a Christian family. They go to church together. They're raising their children the same way. Her life is affected here and now. This is it's Urson. Uh, coming up the mountain here, uh, we're going to see in just a moment. And Urson has been a fighter, just a rough neck kind of fellow. He goes with me as a bodyguard if we go to a less safe area. I'm very thankful to have him. He has laid down his machete. They don't have guns. They rob stores with machetes in the islands. He has laid down his machete, and he's a, he's a man of peace now. Uh, very much so a peaceful fellow. In eternity, he has the hope of heaven. In uh, this life now, he has a peaceful life. Antony, who we're going to see in just a second, is still, still working on his challenges. He's uh, struggling with alcoholism. But what, a, what an effect the Bible has had on his life and will continue to have when he fully overcomes this problem. It affects their eternity. It affects their lives here now. The lady inside the house is Rakinta. And you're not going to believe this, but she lost her two-year-old daughter. Her, she and her husband had one child, two-year-old daughter. And that daughter passed away because they weren't following the Bible. Ask me more about it, but it's clear and distinct. Because they weren't following the Bible, a chain of events ensued that cost the daughter her life. Then her husband passed away because he was following the Bible and some others didn't like it. He lost his life. And so she lost a lot in the name of uh, religion, in the name of God, in the name of the church. And it was another sister in the church here in Naaman Village who gave Rakenta a child, gave her a baby several years ago. This is Jerez. When he was a baby, he was given to her. So she lost a lot in the name of what is spiritual. And then she gained a lot in the, name of, in, 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 in the same way because she's a member of the church. So in eternity, yes, their lives are affected. Their lives are affected here and now. Thank you for your good involvement in our work and your good attention today.